Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's craft chat. Uh, my name is Catherine Hall. I'm curator at Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. And today we're going to be focusing on Breaking Tradition, which is our current exhibition. Uh, and I'm excited to be able to walk through the space with you today. But before we begin, I want to take an opportunity to tell you about all of the exciting events that we have coming up at the Craft Center. Um, first off, this Saturday, we have a polymer clay workshop uh, that you can register through our website at crafthouston.org. And that is going to be a virtual web, uh, workshop where you're actually going to be able to pick up your kit here and then uh, join us through Zoom from home uh, in the comfort of your own home. And then I also would like to mention that um, we will be having on Thursday at 6 p.m., is one of our studio sessions with our current resident artist, Hong Hong, and our curatorial fellow, Maria Lisa Hegg, uh, which is always a lot of fun. It's a great opportunity to kind of see inside Hong's studio, learn about her process, and also kind of what's inspiring some of the work that she is making here at the center. And then don't forget, mark your calendars for uh, the first Saturday in December. We are going to be having, instead of Hands on Houston in person, we've started Hands on Houston to go. And you're going to be able to learn how to make your own scratch foam printed uh, wrapping paper. So perfect in time for the holidays. Uh, we look forward to having you stop by. And I guess I should also mention that we are, in fact, open to the public with limited hours. Um, we are open from Thursday through Saturday from 10 to 5, we are asking people to register through our website at crafthouston.org. Also, too, if you feel so inclined to help us keep our programming free, uh, we would love for you to uh, make a donation if you feel so inclined through our website as well. Um, so that's all the announcements I have. I also want to give a big shout out and thanks to our curatorial fellow, Maria Lisa Hegg who is going to be uh, filming today's session uh, and has really become our phenomenal IT guru. So we really uh, want to give a big shout out to her. And before we start the tour, uh, just for the safety of Maria Lisa and everybody else in the room, I am going to put on my mask. We're asking everybody to wear a mask when inside the building. Um, so bear with me one moment while I put this on and then we will uh, start the tour and save questions for the end. Okay, I'm hoping everybody can still hear me, uh, even with my mask on. Uh, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about, you know, what is this exhibition about? What is Breaking Tradition, Contemporary Approaches to the Decorative Arts? Well, it's actually looking at three individual artists who are really using um, craft material and craft media to probe into the history of the decorative arts and also think about um, how they identify and how we identify with the decorative arts today. So you might ask, you know, what, what, is that, what does that mean? What are the decorative arts? Well, the decorative arts is a form of fine art is how it's classified uh, by museums and galleries uh, and scholars. And it involves uh, functional and beautiful objects. So a lot of those objects are made uh, with a very strong craft tradition of process and technique. Um, that's going to include anything from functional vessels, ceramics, all the way to furniture. And so we're going to kind of explore some of that history today through these artists' work. So I want to go ahead and uh, start by beginning with uh, this wonderful furniture maker, Sophie Glenn. Sophie is uh, currently teaching in Starkville, Mississippi, but she's originally from New York. Uh, she, her background is actually um, in woodworking and furniture making. She uh, got her degree at San Diego State University in San Diego, California. And believe it or not, these very traditional fine furniture making forms are actually made not out of wood, but out of metal. Um, and Sophie really is showing uh, 
how she's been able to really master her craft of working and using her knowledge base of fine uh, woodworking and furniture making um, and replicating some of those processes through metalworking. And so I think, you know, I really love this work because in the world of fine furniture, we often kind of think of wood as a material as kind of uh, the epitome of fine furniture making. Um, and Sophie is really challenging that. She's really showing you that um, wood is not the be all end all material uh, for furniture making, but really uh, in general, it is, um, it is, uh, you know, just one of many materials. So she's actually starting with sheet metal uh, that she is uh, then able to bend uh, and score and then treat with a, a plethora of different um, techniques that she's using. Here you're actually seeing her demi loon uh, table called Moonstruck. What I love about Sophie's work is that she's really um, very much so, um, she <laughs> has kind of this tongue in cheek approach to how she's titling her work. So I think of, uh, the film Moonstruck here, but it's a play on words of a French demi loon table, which is a half moon shape. Um, it's a French uh, 18th century table. You kind of see how the legs are tapering down towards the bottom. Um, and you know, what is causing the, the surface to resemble uh, actual wood is she is rusting the material um, using kind of a very acidic solution, such as like vinegar to really control and create that really beautiful patina that you see. And this is, all of our furniture is very functional. Um, the legs actually swivel out into the back. Uh, and that is what will allow you then to be able to um, actually have a full circular uh, functional table that you would have instead of just the half portion. And I wanna go back to this Rebel Rebel chair. This is a shaker style ladder back chair. Um, that you can see traditionally with the horizontal slats of the ladder back, but I really want to point out that she's this incredible seat that she's made. Uh, it's replicating like a woven rush, which is like a fiber material, but she's actually woven annealed wire, which let me just tell you, that is very, very laborious. And uh, it's just an absolutely beautiful, beautiful chair. Um, and so again, really making you think about uh, challenging the hierarchy of material within uh, how uh, we are defining what fine furniture making is. Really quickly, because I, I want to uh, move on to some of the other artists, I would like to point out um, this is a, another fun title, Purple Rain. And uh, obviously it's a reference to uh, Prince's song, Purple Rain. But it's a play on words with the word rain because it's also referring to uh, the British monarchy um, of, of reigning. Uh, and you know, why is it purple? It's alluding to uh, the town of Windsor, the royal town of Windsor. Uh, purple is the regal color, of course. And because this is a Windsor style bench, which has its uh, foundations and uh, being developed as an archetype in Windsor, um, she's really referencing that. And I love how she's actually, uh, the surface treatment that she's using is she's spray painting the surface and then sanding it down. But it really gives the appearance of a worn piece of furniture. And the color palette is very reminiscent of like a shaker style of furniture. Um, the shakers in England were really uh, not actually uh, afraid to use color. And so that's a really interesting connection to that long-standing history there. But again, it's just really incredible to see uh, that this is actually made of metal as opposed to um, being made of wood. So, and I'd like to kind of move on for a second. Um, I would like to introduce you to the work of Stephen Young Lee. Uh, Stephen is the resident director at Archie Bray in Helena, Montana, uh, which is you know, a renowned uh, ceramics institution. Um, Steven is Korean American and uh, he really uses the language of ceramics to kind of investigate um, how cultural identity is encoded 
into uh, some of these objects that we know and appreciate. And so I think for Stephen, he's trained as a uh, traditional ceramicist. Uh, he studied at Alfred University, and he also has experience uh, teaching um, in a number of different places, including he spent some time in China as well, which has a, you know, if you think about um, Chinese porcelain, you think of a very long, strong history with blue and white ceramics. So I want to take a minute to look at uh, this piece here. This is gourd base with bats and clouds. And um, this is a, um, it's interesting to think about the traditional um, Asian motifs that would be incorporated into Asian porcelain. Um, this is kind of a play on a traditional motif um, where bats and clouds would be represented that have certain symbolic meaning, um, kind of denoting good luck or fortune. Here he's used the symbol of Batman, a pop cultural reference that he's injected into this uh, traditional uh, motif within Asian ceramics. Um, and I really love what he said about uh, why Batman. So Batman for him was a uh, superhero character that was really kind of um, a, a regular, regular person, a regular human being that was not bestowed with superhero powers per se, but really um, kind of it was through his armor that he donned that, that made him um, powerful as opposed to kind of being sent down um, from the mythological stories that we have with a lot of different comic book heroes like Superman, for instance. And so I love how he has integrated the symbol into this piece here. Um, and I'm going to move on to another piece. So this piece is uh, his vase with yellow glaze and lobed rim. It's a, a traditional begonia shaped vessel uh, that one would find. And I have to say, so, I mean, Stephen is an incredible ceramicist who throws these beautiful, uh, very proportional, oftentimes um, traditional fine ceramic forms. But for him, it's about challenging, again, those hierarchies that we have that really kind of often dictate the value of an object, which is thinking about um, beauty found within symmetry and proportion. And in uh, Steve's work, he actually really allows the pieces that he throws to crack and bend um, when it's in the kiln environment. So you have these incredible uh, deconstructed pieces that uh, you know, have lost some of their symmetry and some of that traditional way that we might define what beauty is in this particular practice. And here, I think, you know, going back to how we encode cultural identity into objects, um, this really striking yellow color um, is very reminiscent of uh, the yellow, imperial yellow color that one might see um, in the Qing dynasty in China. Um, and it also, too, if you think about um, some of the more seedy history of the color association of yellow, um, yellow meaning a kind of form of racial slur that uh, would have been used as early as the 18th century um, in Anglo cultures to reference um, Asian people. And so, you know, I think Stephen is really kind of referencing these dualities of how we identify with color and really kind of exposing this history as well. And I have to, what's kind of interesting about the technical ability with this piece is that, you know, um, that imperial yellow color that I mentioned that is part of uh, King Dynasty imperial ceramics would have used a lead-based paint. Well, here, uh, because lead is kind of a little bit dangerous to work with, Stephen is actually working with a low uh, temperature glaze that he's firing, um, he's coating on the surface of his piece multiple times in thin layers. I think there's uh, maybe as many as six firings all together that layer by layer he's building up. Um, it's a non-toxic, uh, it's non-lead-based glaze, I guess I should say, but that's what's giving you that really beautiful, beautiful, striking color. Um, he's firing it at a very high temperature, uh, which gives you that beautiful look. And even see how, um, you know, that really lovely drippy quality that you even see 
um, coming off of, of his pieces as well down in this detail. Thank you, Marilisa. Um, so I wanna kind of move on to one last piece of Steve's. This is his jar with scroll pattern, and it is uh, borrowed from a traditional archetype of a Korean moon jar. Um, Steve also notes that uh, the moon jar is a very uh, traditional cultural symbol of Korean culture. It was actually something that was integrated and referenced uh, during the 2018 Winter Olympics. Um, and it's traditionally made actually by creating two um, kind of uh, half uh, shapes of a uh, sphere. Uh, and he's really kind of calling attention to that here by splicing his vessel right down the center. And again, really kind of challenging um, how we're thinking about proportion um, and how we're thinking about um, symmetry as well. So, and, you know, here he's referencing... Um, a scroll pattern on the surface, again, um, kind of this really beautiful uh, decorative motif that you see. And I think, really, so if you want to kind of show a little bit of the back, you can really see like how um, the piece might have sat in the kiln. You know, he's not like grinding down any of these components. Um, he's really kind of bringing that into light and, and calling attention to um, the beauty kind of within the uh, deconstruction of this form. Uh, of course, you have that really yummy buildup of that um, slightly tinted um, blue glaze as well. So um, the next artist that I would like to bring our attention to is Beth Lipman. Beth is uh, currently living in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. Um, Beth is trained as a glass artist, but works in a number of different um, media. And you know, one thing that's really interesting about Beth's work is her relationship between um, the glass that she makes and photography. And so, um, you know, I think Beth said it very well. She's really interested in thinking about kind of um, the era of. Uh, capitalism um, within the history of the fine arts and the decorative arts. And uh, she's thinking about, especially also too in craft, how uh, we think about the passage of time through um, kind of fetishizing and looking at um, material labor. And so you think about fine craftsmanship takes a lot of uh, hands, uh, a, a skilled work uh, with one's hands and also time as well. And so here uh, she's actually um, blowing these glass forms. They're reminiscent of still Dutch still, still life paintings from the 17th century. One might even think about uh, Peter Clay's. And um, I think here, this is her cheese and fruit. Um, she's creating these forms in glass and then she's photographing them and then reproducing them uh, into these artworks. So it's kind of this really interesting relationship, I think, between um, thinking about uh, referencing a two-dimensional painting of sorts, so the still life that we think of, um, bring it into a three-dimensional form and then returning, um, returning it back to a more two-dimensional format. And here she's gotten really creative. This is a C print that is uh, printed on the face of acrylic and she's kind of created this shadow box effect. So it really calls into play um, the introduction of light and shadow that one would see in her glass pieces. So kind of really capturing that really lovely fleeting moment with her sculpture, um, much like one would have created a still life in the 17th century, um, a Vanitas painting that really kind of uh, reminds you of our own mortality. Um, and this is part of a larger series called her ephemera series. So really kind of hyping up that concept of ephemerality itself. Um, next, I would like to uh, quickly turn to um, this beautiful photograph. This is uh, her chalice at Priest Rock, uh, Lake Clark, Alaska. Um, and this, she's actually, again, she has blown this beautiful glass chalice. It's kind of functioning as its own looking glass. 
And she's actually been situating this piece in an actual landscape. She went to uh, the state park um, at Lake Clark in Alaska and photographing this piece from um, what is known as Priest Rock. And uh, this piece is really kind of looking at this concept of our relationship with as humans to nature and how we perceive wilderness. So really kind of, again, like looking at um, kind of uh, almost kind of um, trying to capture and consolidate some of these concepts of our interactions with nature, um, kind of that wild and unruly wilderness. Um, and this has a long-standing history with this particular site. So I, I wanted to take the opportunity to mention that this uh, particular site is uh, Lake Clark, Alaska, uh, was not always called Priest Rock. So this was um, a park that was um, really kind of um, stumbled upon or discovered um, by uh, people that uh, came to Alaska um, and were using this as like a retreat. But really um, its true history is on the uh, indigenous land of the Dena'ina uh, peoples. And so um, the rock that where this was uh, photographed at uh, was not uh, called uh, Priest Rock. That was named later on. Um, instead, it was named the rock that stands alone. And I think it's important to take an opportunity to really recognize um, some of these longstanding histories of uh, colonization um, and reappropriation of lands, um, including uh, the very land that our organization is on um, at the Craft Center. So I wanted to just take a quick moment uh, to acknowledge that the Craft Center is on the ancestral lands of the Karankawa, the Kwafitakan, the Atacapa Ishak, and the Sana peoples. And so I think, you know, this is a really good opportunity to talk about those histories that are often glossed over in the way that we are portraying um, where it is that we live, and also the commodification of culture as well, even thinking about um, that long standing history of the decorative arts itself and how it's traded in a commercial market. In fact, I think it's really interesting to uh, note that during this pandemic, the um, fine arts market that the decorative arts resides in is still booming despite the pandemic. And so I think that um, it's a really conflicting relationship that we have with these objects uh, and those that made it. So moving on, I wanted to uh, then kind of end the tour today with this beautiful series that Beth made uh, when she was a resident at the Kohler Arts, the John Michael Kohler Arts Center. Um, this is made out of uh, cast metal and it's uh, called her distill series. It's really kind of referencing these like uh, miniature furniture dioramas that one might create and that's been popular. But also she's, um, while you can actually start picking up pieces of furniture, if you take a closer look, you'll also notice how she's interspersed um, things that she's collected from nature, such as lichen and moss, that would then kind of be put through that casting process. It would burn out, but what remains is those beautiful textures that you see. Um, and really kind of thinking about um, this concept of the Anthropocene era, um, you know, the, the era in which, you know, humans first occupied our land and our earth. And also thinking about, you know, what, it, what are the things that we leave behind? We think about all this time and energy that's put into um, making these beautiful objects, but what happens when we're gone? And, and how, do, how do those objects interact with the nature that will remain um, in that space? And so I hope today you were able to really kind of get a uh, kind of better understanding of these three artists um, how they're kind of rethinking um, the decorative arts and how they identify with it. Um, and as well as, you know, how, how are these pieces uh, relevant in, in today's world? So thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'd be more than happy to take any questions that you might have. I'm gonna 
pull out my handy dandy phone and see if I can pull up the chat so that I can actually see if anybody has any questions. If you'll bear with me just one moment. Oh, hi, Rebecca. Uh, I see that you asked uh, that you would love to know the necklace that I'm wearing. Um, and, you know, I have to say, I cannot recall uh, the artist's name at the moment. I did get it on a trip to Edinburgh, Scotland. So it is an artist that lives in Edinburgh. And I'm so sorry to the artist and to you for not remembering the artist's name. But that's a really wonderful question. I love this piece. It's um, really kind of this beautiful traditional reference to one might think of pearls, but using felt and thread. So thank you so much for that question. Uh, let's see. Um, I think that's all the comments. Does anybody have any specific question that you'd like for me to answer? And hopefully I will actually be able to answer the, uh, the next one. Okay, well, I think um, if we don't have any further questions, uh, then I think I will wrap up our craft chats today. Thank you so much for your time. I hope everybody uh, can stay safe, uh, be well, take a deep breath. Um, and I really appreciate you joining us today. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you.